This season on Navigating Abroad, we're back at the World AI Festival in Cannes, talking to some of the brightest leaders in artificial intelligence. We'll be delving into the important questions around the impact of AI on our world, what the ethical implications are, and how we can ensure these technologies are used for good. Nelani Saxena is an accomplished leader and the executive director of Portal, a pioneering organization that is transforming the way businesses operate. With over 20 years of experience in business management and technology, Nelani is passionate about creating innovative solutions that help displaced persons find the help they need during tragedies. Nelani, I'm so glad we got a chance to meet at day two of the festival and you can join us here for day three. Obviously, we've taken over a bit of the event space um, and it has been such a pleasure getting to know amazing thought leaders like you. Can you share a little bit with me about what Portal is and what you provide to the ecosystem for AI? Sure. So um, I entered into the humanitarian space a couple of years ago very recently during COVID, as a strategist. That is my foundation and my training. When I started understanding what was going on and how humanitarian challenges are solved, I found that there was an opportunity and a need for communication, collaboration, and trusted information flow across all the different helper entities. Whenever we hear news about um, some crisis happening somewhere in the world, and not every crisis makes it to the news, when we do hear um, news about something, there are generally so many well-intentioned people that get involved to try to help. That's a wonderful thing. What happens is that while we have an abundance of people wanting to help, organizations, NGOs, INGOs, private businesses, foundations, we don't have enough of trusted information flow and coordination communication. Yes. So Great intention, but the impact is not as strong as it could be if there was more of that trusted information flow. Indeed. And, you know, what I was uh, saying yesterday at our talk was that um, generally, and even I myself am guilty of this, up until my foray into this world, I thought that, you know, what people need that when they're displaced by climate change, when they're displaced by war or by public health emergencies, um, economics as well, um, that perhaps it's food, water, shelter, maybe employment as well. Yeah. I hadn't really expanded my mind to think about the tech needs of mm -hmm. the displaced person. Yes. Uh, that was brand new and eye-opening to me, that people have to prove that they are who they say they are so that they can actually access aid. They need to be able to have telecom access to be able to have a bank account so they can get that, that stipend. Yes. They need to be able to have some paperwork in order to be able to cross a checkpoint. And without, and there's many other uh, pieces of information, and this digital information aid is a huge piece of the aid. So when we think about food, water, medical, et cetera, we should also be thinking about digital information aid. But yes. that's not the only piece. There's trusted information flow that we require across the all these different organizations that I mentioned. When they're trying to choreograph an effort to save lives, they really need to have it captured in some kind of a system, yeah. some kind of a flow. And we don't want to lose people along the way or lose track of people along the way. And so that's where, thinking from a strategic angle, from a consulting angle, um, I thought about, well, how do we start with the person who's hurting? Mm -hmm. The person who's at risk, who's in need. How do we start from where they are and how do we actually take them forward through the journey of what they're experiencing? that we think about the displaced person from a place of compassion, from a place of empathy. So let's draw out their journey, their experiences, and based on that, on based on what they're experiencing, I created this eight-stage journey after studying what's going on with crises around the world today mm -hmm. and studying historic information as well. I've talked to many people that work at many of these organizations, private and public and international as well. And it seemed like it's the same types of uh, experiences and the same type of flow that the displaced person experiences, whether it's an earthquake, whether it is a war, whether it is um, something climate related. Once the disruption happens, people have the same needs and the same process of rebuilding. Exactly. Yeah. And then I started coding it and started labeling, okay, well, at this stage, these are the needs of the displaced person. At this stage, this is what they're feeling. At this stage, these are what their fears are, what their concerns are, what their appetites are. This is what, what would be most helpful. Yes. And then what I could do, I could actually call up the organizations and say, can you take stage three, part two? Yes. Can you take stage one, part four? 
And most of them were already involved, right? I'm not actually engineering that their involvement. They were already involved. But you're coordinating the care so that it's at the right time for where the needs are and as it's moving through the process. More effectively with one another. Yeah, absolutely. Right? We get overloaded, like when we moved on, we were trying to help in Ukraine so that we wouldn't get overloaded with tons of donations, literally tons, I mean this, literally, of donations of toothpaste and toothbrushes when there were other needs as well. Yes, right. yes. Yeah, so you don't want an overabundance of the things that you have readily available and a complete underwhelming abundance of water. <laughs> exactly. So it was this flow that I had created of these eight stages. And what I really wanted to do was to, um, was to in engage, invite in and engage all the helpers. Yes. These well-intentioned helpers with all these resources. I will never have those resources. I am not that person. But yep. if I could create a system that would hold all this energy together, and allow it to flow through, keeping in mind sensitivity for the experiences of the displaced person, displaced migrant, refugee, these are all technical terms and there's legalities around that, but that's, it's the same um, concept. Yeah, my, my, like, my grandparents yeah. were stateless refugees for multiple years. So I, I definitely come from that mindset. And in fact, my best friend growing up uh, was in a refugee camp from the ages of three to four. Oh my God. Uh, escaping Poland and Germany before she came to the US. Yeah. So I've always had a mindset for people that you can be going along in your life and everything seems like, you know, we plan and uh, things are executing. And I, I kind of like that, that statement that we plan and God laughs, right? Because the best laid plans can shift on a dime and it's about how do we rise for each other and help to stabilize through those processes. So I love that you're using journey mapping and user experience design and really thinking through the last mile so that when the solution is delivered, it actually meets the needs versus what we think we people need that are not in that situation and probably don't really have a lot of understanding of it, right? Absolutely. And it's interesting that you bring this up because my building was partially submerged during Hurricane Sandy. So we're experiencing in the developed world things that we thought were not really um, going to affect us as right. much. And we, we just cannot refuse to accept that climate change is real and that by beyond our lifetime, at the end of the century, in 77 years, there'll be more people dying of climate-related um, challenges than cancer and infectious diseases combined. And that's like people, that that's where we're talking about death there. But if we talk just about displacement, there's like 13 out of every 100 people, these are all stats published by the UN this year, 13 out of every 100 people will have to face having to move because they're not able to, where they're living isn't able to support them. We have 222 million people across 53 countries this year that are expected to face acute food crises. These are numbers that are really, really disturbing. And so what I wanted to do was to create the system, make sure that it was grounded in ethics and principles, and in doing this and inviting in participants who are helpers, I also needed to invite in technologists. Absolutely. Because they need to help me communicate um, all the information to plug it in. So we are not going to solve this level of a crisis unless everybody comes to the table with their A game. So I love how you're convening a really diverse perspective so that we see around the corners that it, you know, the technologists are going to see things that they've learned from deploying software. The, uh, the philanthropy is going to be able to share some local knowledge about culturally how, how is it appropriate to deliver aid. Yeah. Everybody's seeing a different angle of it that can bring and co-create the right solution. I love that you said co-create because that is the key of all this, right? I want it to be co-created. I also really want it to be bound in certain ethics and I want those ethics, those principles to be laid out very clearly, to be agreed to by everyone. So Transparent ethics and rules of engagement, right? If you're not willing to abide by these, then there's probably not a good place for you here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, we respect the rights, data rights, information rights, human rights, all the rights of the displaced person. So fundamentally, we start there. And from there, we have all the other principles. We have the system. And if we can invite in the technologists to help out, to make this all come alive and work, um, if we can invite in all the helpers to actually use the system, then we can actually move forward. So we prototyped in Afghanistan, we moved forward, um, and tried to use it to help in Ukraine. We've done so also in uh, Central America, particularly in Mexico, um, 
uh, and it's been really exciting. There's so much more work to be done, but I have to say that the only reason that I'm here present at this conference is thanks to Dominic Romano, who's the founder of Drainpipe. And somebody we both very much respected, admire. Very much respected, admire, adore as well, I'll say. And he, uh, he just rose to the occasion of using his AI expertise, not an expertise that I have at all, no. using his AI expertise to speed up in a high intensity, high crisis scenario, how we can take an amalgam of all kinds of information and sift it out, distill it, and put it into a format that can actually be used. Yeah, going from an ocean of information to actionable intelligence is quite a process. And it's it, it's something that AI is actually quite good at. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't think humans can process that much information to be able to sift it. So I love that collaboration and that, you know, when waters rise, all boats float that you're facilitating. So for people that are interested in learning more about your journey with yep. Portal and what, how they can be involved, what are some of the best ways to connect with you? So best ways to connect with me personally is LinkedIn okay. <laughs> to learn about Portal. Our website is globalportal.co. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm happy to have a chat with anyone who is interested in helping. We need all kinds of support. So whether that support comes in the form of volunteers to help us build this out and invite in the technologists, invite in all the different helper orgs from the INGOs to the private companies, to the individual grassroots, well-intentioned people who want to help. Um, and to help me actually put this into action so it can become a standard. Absolutely. So we need the volunteers on uh, the helper side, volunteers on the technology side. Mm -hmm. And if there are any technologists that are interested in helping uh, me figure out how to build the plugins to make this system work mm -hmm. and to make all the different platforms that different people use, uh, work and sync into one. Okay. That would be fantastic. And governments as well, so we can actually create the international data standard for trust. So with that said, are, are you guys uh, NGO? Yes. Okay. So at 501c3. I don't know any, any NGOs who don't need uh, fundraising capabilities as well. So are you accepting funding for people that believe in this vision and want to accelerate the deployment of these models? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We would gladly welcome it. There's a donate button on globalportal.co. And so we would gladly welcome any, any fundraising. That, that, that would be tremendous. Wonderful. So for all the people that are concerned when they want to give remotely about the efficacy of that donation, investing in Portal is a way to make sure that at scale we can build a baseline and make sure that our money goes where it's meant to go and meets the needs of people where they're at. Absolutely, fully uh, transparent. We've been self-funded you know, from the beginning since uh, our founding. And uh, this is something we care very, very deeply about. So again, happy to have a conversation with anyone who's interested. Well, I will definitely be following up with you on the volunteer side. Yes. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. Thank, Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah.